and thank you to uh, Sarasota Manatee Federation for hosting my cooking class. I'm going to be preparing uh, a Shabbat meal, as it were, or at least part of it, uh, inspired by, uh, by something that my grandparents, uh, or my grandmother, who wasn't my grandfather who did any of the cooking, uh, would have prepared. Uh, so I'm going to be making three dishes with you today. Uh, the main dish is a uh, salmon dish, uh, and I call it my aromatic salmon in pouch. I particularly like to teach cooking fish in a pouch because it's a very forgiving way to cook fish, even if it goes a little bit over, uh, it's still okay because the pouch keeps it moist uh, and flavorful. Uh, now, salmon is not a very Italian fish, but I always like to say that if salmon were an Italian fish, this is certainly how it would be prepared. Uh, and my grandparents loved to prepare fish, uh, even though my grandfather wouldn't be fishing salmon off this dock on Atlantic Beach. But still, this is a presentation that uh, would not have been unusual to see. So we're going to put it together with some fresh tomatoes, some fresh herbs, uh, and cook it in the pouch. And I'll go more into it when we get uh, to preparing it. And as a vegetable uh, side dish, we're going to make some spinach and chickpeas. This is something my grandmother very often made at home for us. Uh, it's very nice. It's uh, kind of refreshing because it's cooked with uh, lemon juice. So uh, it's a great accompaniment to a fish dish. And then finally, uh, we're going to make a dessert. Uh, the dessert is called the uh, Zbrizolona. Actually, Zbrizolona is an Italian dialect word uh, that would translate into Italian as sbriciolona, and that translates into English as something crumbly. Briciola in Italian means crumbly, and this cake, which is right here in front of us, uh, I prepared it yesterday, uh, is something that when at the end we'll uh, cut into it, you'll see that you can't, you know, cut normal slices out of it, it kind of breaks apart into chunks. Uh, so, you know, my grandparents, would certainly also have added other things, certainly other vegetables. There's always lots of vegetables uh, at our uh, Friday night dinners. My grandmother loved to make a dish of uh, steamed, uh, I'm sorry, stewed green beans with tomatoes. Uh, also uh, what she called banya, which is okra. Uh, again, uh, cooked with tomatoes, so you can see tomatoes are definitely a recurring theme. Uh, so let's get started first with the salmon. And first thing I'd like to do is to do the aromatic mixture. So if you have gotten the ingredients already uh, and are prepared to cook along, uh, then please do. Uh, I have an assistant here. This is my daughter, Gabriella. And uh, so uh, for the aromatic mixture in the recipe that you have called for oregano, um, but it's been hard to find oreg it's been hard to find some strange things these days and I have wasn't able to find oregano so we're going to use marjoram instead and actually marjoram is a wonderful herb to use with seafood uh, sometimes even better than uh, oregano so Gabriella is going to uh, take these uh, stems of marjoram just kind of strip the leaves off of them and uh, then we're going to chop them and in the meantime here I have some parsley. This is some uh, flat leaf Italian parsley. I really prefer it a lot to the curly parsley. I find the flat leaf parsley has much more fragrance, much more aroma. And what I'm doing now is uh, I, I have to rinse it off. So I'm going to uh, take the leaves off the stems and I'm going to put them in a bowl so that I can uh, cover it with water, swish them around and uh, wash them that way. Uh, unfortunately, uh, when it's wet, parsley does not chop very easily. And I do like to chop my parsley very, very fine. So then I'm going to show you my little trick for drying the parsley. So here we go. Pretty much got all of it here. So I'm going to put some uh, cold water in. Just enough. The covered parsley and swish it around. And then to get it really, really nice and dry, I'm going to get some paper towels. So one sheet goes on the bottom, 
And then I lift up the parsley and shake it off like this and spread it around. It always helps, of course, to shake off the excess water before you put it on the paper towel. Spread it out and then put another sheet of paper towel right on top. Uh, we need more. <laughs> Keep them going. And then, after you've patted it down, roll it up very nice and tight. And in fact, I even squeeze it, give it a nice squeeze. You see some of the water still coming out. Uh, but in any case, the paper will really absorb all the water that way. And then we can lay it out on our cutting board. And then we can chop it. And we'll go like this. So you see, I keep the tip of my knife anchored, and then I go up and down with the knife, go in one direction, go in the other direction, and keep on going. In fact, my mother, who I, I learned to cook from, uh, liked to say in a gleeful way that the trick to getting char parsley chopped really finely to just keep on chopping. So that's what we're gonna do. Is it good? You want more? I want as much as you can do by the time I finish my parsley. Okay. All right. Going you are going very slowly. Well, yes. <laughs> the stems are very small. It smells good, though. Yeah, margarine is a great herb. And you know, normally margarine is really hard to find, so it's kind of ironic. It was marjoram that I was able to find today. And yes, I have tried growing herbs, but somehow it never really works out very well for me, unfortunately. Okay, so my parsley is ready. And so I'm going to uh, make my aromatic mixture in here, in this bowl. So I'm gonna scoop up parsley, not put it all in, actually I'm gonna put just a little bit aside, and I'll show you what I do with that later. We are going to use it in the fish as well, but not in the aromatic mixture. And then uh, I need some garlic. I'm going to do, I think one nice big garlic clove should be enough. Here we go. And the thing about garlic is that uh, uh, everybody always says that if it's Italian, it must have garlic in it. Well, it's not really true. In fact, um, Italians use garlic with a pretty light hand. Okay, to get it peeled well, you don't use a light hand. You just whack it like this. I don't like to whack on the blade of the knife, so I always do it on the handle instead like this. And when the, the garlic clove cracks and opens up, then that's when you can get this skin off easily. I'm going to cut off that little bit that was attached to the clove, and then we're going to chop this very finely too. To get it started, it helps to make a few cuts. I'll do, if it's a thick clove like that, I'll cut it in half, and then, oh, that looks good. You can start chopping that now. Okay, I see it up. Yes, doing much better. And then a few cuts lengthwise, and that gets me started. It's not fine enough but then I can finish chopping it uh, easily this way. So there's an interesting um, saying in Italy that in Italian is uh, vesti da turco e mangia da ebreo, which means that you should dress like a Turk and eat like uh, a Jew, uh, at least an Italian Jew. And uh, because it, Italian Jews were uh, very, very, uh, very, very smart and able to make delicious food out of very simple ingredients, as long as they were fresh and good ingredients. Of course, I've always thought that it would be good if you dressed like an Italian too. But that's just me. I think Italians have a great sense of style. So 
the garlic is chopped very finely as well. And that's good too. You can put that in. Here, you know what? Let me give you this because you want to scoop it up and get it in there. And if you scrape with your knife, it's not good for the blade. And the only reason I'm doing it is because I keep the blade really, really flat. That way I'm not really scraping. Excellent. Okay, we put the garlic in. And then we're gonna add some salt. The amount of salt that you put in really depends on how much fish you have. So it's useful to have the fish here that you can look at when you're putting the salt in. So let's see, that's the left part of the fish, the left part of the fish. Okay, so that's good. That's a good amount of salt. And then can you ask me the olive oil? And then we put a generous amount of very good extra virgin olive oil. Um, it's really important when you buy olive oil that uh, it is an extra virgin. You always want to use uh, the highest quality, which is uh, what extra virgin is. It's the highest grade of olive oil. Uh, you can, you know, try different olive oils, see which ones you like. Um, you know, if it does have my name on the label, then it's, it's probably going to be a good one. Uh, but there's lots of wonderful olive oils that come from Italy. The important thing is that when you do look at the label, uh, you want to see that it says that the olives are actually in, in, from Italy. It's not just produced in Italy. So I have stirred my aromatic mixture together. Uh, and the amount of oil that you, thank you, the amount of oil you put in is just enough so that you, you can see that it's oozing out of the mixture. Okay, let's keep this close by because we're going to need it again. So now I'm going to take my salmon and ideally it should be skinned so there's no skin and uh, the place where you buy it usually will be able to do that for you. I kind of bunch it up and I want to butterfly it which means kind of opening it up like a book. Uh, so you cut a flap like this and this is so that you can get some of the aromatic mixture inside as well but don't cut all the way through. And then we can uh, assemble it. I didn't know that you did that. What? You said you were oh. <laughs> and I'm going to get some aluminum foil. I like to use the um, the extra long aluminum foil so I can make a nice big couch and use a nice big piece like this. And it Loud aluminum foil. Um, it's also good for the aluminum foil to be um, the what is it called? Heavy duty, the, the heavier. One. Okay, so let's put this out of the way. So a little bit of olive oil on the bottom so that the fish won't stick. And I haven't found that it really makes any difference whether you have the shiny side or the opaque side. And then we put the fish right in the middle here. Uh, Michaela, my other daughter, is our cameraman here. Can you see this, Michaela? Mm -hmm. Okay. So first I'm going to hold the flap open like this. We put some of the aromatic mixture inside. Thank you. And so, do you know anything about why tomatoes have been attributed to Jews? Yes. Because my mother told me this <laughs> that um, it's believed that some of the first people to it's believed that some of the first people to step off the ship when Columbus landed in the Americas were Jewish. Um, and they discovered tomatoes and then they brought tomatoes back to Italy. And you know, originally they thought of them as an ornament instead of a food. But of course, you realize that it was an excellent food. It was very delicious. Yeah. Oh no. Okay. So, this is the first part. Now, 
that we talked about the tomatoes, it's time to prepare them. So, here's one for you. Thank you. And one for me. And. You're just so much prettier. Okay, we can switch it. Like. <laughs> First, we're going to cut out the core. So, I use the tip of my knife and I just cut around the core like this. Of that. Yeah, this can be our little trash bowl. And then we're going to peel the tomato because otherwise we have tough skin. So I'm going to teach you my little peeling trick. Uh, and it, what it is is a way to understand why a peeler cuts through skin because after all, uh, the blade of a peeler is just like the blade of a knife and it works exactly the same way. To show you this, I am going to sacrifice a banana. And the reason is because I'm going to show you that if I just cut straight down with my knife through the banana, uh, well, yeah, I could cut through because the knife is sharp, but it kind of all squashes. And certainly if I try to do a thin slice and I just push down like this, you see, it's just not going to work. On the other hand, if I use my knife in a slicing motion, sawing motion, then it'll cut through the banana very easily. And I can do a thin slice. Very easily. So what we want to do is we want to apply that same principle to the blade of our peeler. And although most people use a peeler just by pulling it straight down, that would be like trying to cut the banana going straight down with a knife. Instead, we're going to use it back and forth in a slicing motion like this. You see, use the whole length of the blade back and forth, go all the way around. And the reason why we uh, cut out the core first is because uh, the easiest way to get it started is to get the blade right at the edge of where the skin is cut. Put the blade right under the skin and then go back and forth and it will catch and it will peel the tomato very easily. And you can use this technique for lots of things too. You can use it uh, to uh, peel fruit, especially you know ripe fruit if you're doing a dessert with very ripe fruit. Uh, you try and peel like this, you'll never be able to. Uh, and also, of course, peel things with skin that's kind of tough, maybe uh, an eggplant or something like that. So you just keep going around. And you know, once you've gotten the hang of it, it's really much faster than the boiling water method where you have to make a cross that went in the tomato, you've got to put them in boiling water, uh, take them out, burn your fingers to get the skin off while it's hot, uh, and then wash the pot too, so it's much better. Then, after we peeled it, ah, what's wrong? Well, I'm behind. Oh, okay. <laughs> we want to remove the seeds, and the reason for that is because uh, the seeds are quite watery, the inside of the tomato, and I don't want the inside of the pouch to be too watery. So I'm going to, the best way to cut the seeds is to cut across, across the sections of the tomato. And in a round tomato, the sections run from top to bottom like this. So I'm going to cut across the tomato around the equator, as it were. And then you see we've cut through the sections, and it's easy with your thumb just to scoop those seeds out like this. All the way around. Now, don't worry. Down. Yeah, OK. Um, don't worry if there's a seed or two that's left, that's not a problem. In fact, if I were doing a tomato sauce, I would just not worry about getting the seeds out. I would cook the whole tomato. And then I want to do some nice small dice. So I do narrow cuts in one direction, turn it around and do narrow cuts in the other direction, like this. And you see, Gabriella's pace is so that <laughs> you can keep up too. And don't fall behind. Oh, yes, I said the curve. <laughs> yes, I, so now I want to um, cover the salmon with our tomatoes like this.
No worries, you're doing fine. Okay. Uh, I probably won't need all of it. Yeah, I'll cut some of this. Well, it has a little meltdown. We'll keep on going here. I'm sorry. Okay. Fish. Okay. I think that's enough. All right. Just enough to cover like this. Oh. <laughs> and then a little bit of salt for the tomatoes because otherwise the tomatoes will feel left out. A little bit like this. And a little bit of white wine. So the rule about cooking with wine is that there's no such thing as cooking wine. Uh, there's only wine that you wouldn't mind having some of, uh, as well as cooking with. So this is actually a very nice suave uh, from uh, near Verona. And then finally that parsley that I left behind, remember? The parsley that I left behind goes on top. Like this. Oh, it's beautiful. Okay, so now, Even my there we, go. Thank you. we close the couch. So I do the corners first. I kind of pinch around my index finger on the four corners, like this. And then I bring the sides together. We want to seal the crap moisture inside. And the reason we're using a big piece for it is to make sure that there's plenty of space inside for the steam to circulate. I have preheated my oven at 400 on convection heat. If you don't have convection heat, you can actually do it at 425 on regular heat. And we're going to put the pouch on a tray. And it goes in the oven. Yeah. I'll set a timer for about 20 minutes. All right, should be done just, just at the right time. All right, well, that was fun. Yes. Okay, so we're ready for the next dish. The next dish is the spinach and chickpeas. All right, so look at all the spinach we have. We have a lot of spinach, although you know the thing about spinach is you have to start with a lot of spinach because when you cook it down, it goes down to almost nothing. Good. Turn this on high. Okay. So, uh, we're going to cook the spinach first in boiling water. And a leafy green like spinach doesn't actually need a whole lot of water, so I just have maybe this much water in the pot. Uh, and, you know, the thing about leafy greens like spinach is that, uh, you know, if you put them in a skillet or in a, in a pan uh, directly, they will wilt down. But the problem is that they release a lot of liquid in doing so. That's why we have mountains of spinach here, which are going to go down to nothing because there's a lot of water content. And so if you're sauteing spinach or doing some gray spinach uh, and have all this liquid come out and then you cook it down because you don't want all that spinach liquid in there, you end up concentrating the flavor of that liquid and it actually becomes uh, much too strong and I think that's a lot of times why spin kids don't like spinach because it has that strong taste. Instead if you boil it first it removes the uh, liquid uh, and then we can cook it however we want. We can saute it with olive oil and garlic or we can braise it the way we're doing it now. Uh, so I believe we have a question. Uh, somebody would like to know if they can have frozen spinach. 
So somebody asked if we can, uh, we can use frozen spinach, and the answer is yes, of course, you can. Um, and actually, my mother used to use frozen spinach quite a bit, but that was at a time when uh, fresh spinach wasn't really uh, as easily available as it is now. Uh, so now it's pretty easy to get fresh spinach. In fact, you can even buy bags of spinach that have uh, been washed already, although it's not a bad idea to wash them again. But most importantly, they're really just the leaves like these are, where they don't have that long stem. If you do buy the bunches of spinach, uh, it's a good idea to go in and try and remove at least the, the longest and the thin, uh, thickest of the stems. Okay, so uh, chickpeas. Yes. About do we have something to say about chickpeas? Uh, we do have something to say about chickpeas. <laughs> Um, they, uh, chickpeas were a common thing to eat at Forum because Esther was supposed to have eaten them. Um, and it has been an ancient Jewish custom to eat them. So the question we is, Esther. Esther is did Esther eat the chickpeas with the skin off? Okay. Uh, if she were like my father, she would not have. I don't think she would have. No. Uh, my father never liked the skin of the chickpeas, and you know, these are canned chickpeas, by the way. You can use dry chickpeas and soak them and cook them. But in any case, you're going to end up with a, a thin skin around the chickpea. And if you squeeze the chickpea like this, uh, well, the idea is not to put the chickpea in the trash and put the skin in the trash. But in any case, yeah, you see, you accomplish this. You just do it in your hand like this. Then you save the chickpea and the skin comes off. And it's fun for a few chickpeas. But this was my job because my father didn't like the skin of the chickpeas. And so, well, I, I don't really skin the chickpeas anymore. You're not skinning them? Well, you can skin them some more if you want. I forgot to turn the heat on. So I have to wait a couple more minutes uh, for the water to come to a boil. We can just skin more chickpeas. We could. <laughs> But there's also something else that we could do. I don't think I'm going to like it. <laughs> sure are. We're going to make the cake. Oh, okay. Yes, you're in charge of the cake, remember? Yes. <laughs> okay, so the cake that we're making, again, I told you what it's called. Uh, and it is something, it's a dish that is comes from uh, uh, Mantua, but also Ferrara. Uh, now, Jews lived in both of those cities, and in Ferrara in particular, uh, it's famous uh, because a family called the Finzi Contini lived there. And uh, in fact, there was a novel that was written that was based around the garden of the Finzi Contini's. And uh, the, uh, the Sbrigiolona is a cake that's uh, uh, made with uh, both regular flour and with corn flour. So it's kind of in color. And the corn flour also gives it that sort of crunchiness that's uh, really, really very nice. And it's very easy to make. Um, we're going to begin by grinding up almonds and sugar. And, and of course, we have modern appliances now, which make all of this much, much easier. Do you have to grind the almonds yourself? You have to by chop hand. them by hand. Absolutely. After you finish the chickpeas. Oh, did I have to? No, unfortunately not. And although, it, actually, the food processor came out. I remember when the food processor came out. Really? Yes, I was, I was a young boy at home. And I remember the man who invented it for Cuisinart came to our house with the prototype to show my mother, show how it worked. And my mother always had a very open mind, so she thought it was a great idea. And it is. Wow, and now she has two, where she had two. So, sugar, just regular cane sugar, and cool. almonds. Uh, this is what they call unblanched almonds. It's almonds that uh, still have the skin on them. It gives them a bit of a nuttier, richer flavor. We're going to chop them, not to a powder though. We're going to do uh, kind of a coarse, medium to coarse chop. And I like to use the pulsing action for that. I know it's sugar.
Uh, well, one more. Okay. Perfect. All right. Let's get that mixing bowl. And what do we need to move? You can speak. <laughs> can you move the metal? Ah, yes. Oh, wait, the uh, water is boiling. This is what is finished. I'm going to add a little bit of salt. Yeah. And all of the spinach. Okay. Wow. Remember, it seems like a tremendous amount, but it's going to go down to nothing. And, you know, to get it all in, all we have to do is just push it down, not with your hands, use a pair of tongs like this. Just hard to get into the pot. There we go. Okay, let's give it a couple minutes and answer a question. It's already so small. So um, people want to know if they do get the recipes, how they might get the recipes, and um, that you're going to email them out and how to get in touch with you. Okay. The question is how to get the recipes if you didn't get them and how to get in touch with me. Best way is to go to my website. It's uh, julianohazan.com. G-I-U-L-I-A-N-O-H-A-Z-A-N.com. And once you get to the homepage or any page on the website, you'll always see a place that says Contact Juliano. Uh, and if you click there, it, it, it'll have a link that takes you, will open up your email app and you can email me and then we can have a conversation. I'd be happy to email you the rest of these apps. There are also two other questions. Um, Lisa Lieberman is asked, is the recipe for cake available and the amount, etc. And then Gloria Herkowitz asks, how many minutes pounds to cook the salmon? How many minutes per pound to cook the salmon? It's actually not so much a question of minutes per pound. It's more of a question of how thick the piece of salmon is. So the thinner it is, the faster it will cook. And I usually calculate about 20 minutes for a, an inch to an inch and a half, an inch and a quarter, let's say. I just do it by sight. But uh, the thing is, I would err on the side of slightly less time because you can take it out and then open up a little bit of the pouch and with a fork, go and check and see if the fish flakes. If it does, it's ready. If it's not, then you just put it in for a few more minutes. It's really quite forgiving that way. Okay, so uh, let me take this and move our food processor out of the way. And I think maybe we're ready to continue with the spinach. So we're going to put a pause button on the cake. Okay, and we're going to continue with the spinach. Our holder, colander from the sink, I'll do some more <laughs> A nice little facial. Bring it 
here, so you can see. It smells good. Mm -hmm. You see <laughs> those two bowls? Yeah, but, that's crazy. So I want to squeeze, squeeze the spinach so that the excess water comes out. Yeah. There we go. And then uh, transfer it to this pot over here. There's nothing in this pot yet. It does smell good. Careful. <laughs> they are good. So, my mother always used to call me her official taster, so I guess that <laughs> job is done for you now. Uh, oh, question. Yes. Uh, actually, hold that thought. I will answer in just a second. Uh, mm -hmm. Then, some extra virgin olive oil with my name on it. Mm -hmm. And then the chickpeas, most of them with their skins on still. Okay. And then some lemon juice. Squeeze it through a strainer like this. Avoid getting all the seeds in there. Right. Juicer just uh, died, so I'm waiting for another one. Put a little bit more. Why did you zest that lemon? Ah, we're going to find out very soon. <laughs> Good question. And my grandmother was always quite generous with the lemon juice here. So I think the recipe calls for like four tablespoons or so. And then a little bit of salt. Okay, there it is. We're going to put it on, turn the heat on, put the medium heat or less, put the lid on, and it cooks for about 10 minutes or less. So what was the question? We have three questions. Oh boy. Arlene Salzberg asks, if using frozen chopped spinach, about how many ounces should you use? Ah, good question. And I didn't know the answer until I stopped using frozen spinach. Um, I can't remember exactly. <laughs> it's no, it's definitely less. <laughs> um, and then Gloria Hurwitz asks, would you cook frozen spinach in boiling water or just defrost? I would cook, uh, so the question was, would you cook the frozen spinach in boiling water? Yes, I would cook it in boiling water and don't forget to put the salt in. The salt is really important. It brings out the flavor of the spinach and it also keeps it nice and green. And um, was it who asked uh, about the proportion of frozen? Arlene Salzberg. Arlene, if you can email me through my website, I will look, look it up and get back to you. Um, Christy Sherman want, would like to know if there's a difference in texture and taste between canned chickpeas or soaking them overnight. Okay, so yes, there is a difference. Sometimes you can get uh, better quality, nicer tasting chickpeas if you use them dry. But texture wise, I don't think there's too much of a difference. The key really is that after you've soaked them, you also have to cook them, and you have to be patient enough to cook them until they're tender. So that's the key. And Saturday Newman would like to know where can we buy your olive oil with your name <laughs> on it? Thank you, Saturday. Yeah, well, yes, thank you very much for asking where to buy my olive oil. Um, there's some stores in town that carry it, the Wharton's. Uh, there's a store called Casa Italia. Um, and if you're not in town, actually, you can order it on my website as well. We will ship a case of six bottles to you. So I think we should continue with the cake at this point. And um, I'll look at the time for the spinach. Yes. So where was the, oh, this was the bowl. Okay. Um, that was just about to remove. 
So we're going to transfer the sugar and almonds to the bowl. Gabriella is going to wash her hands because after this, if her hands are going to be essential in continuing this, we're going to add. Hey, 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 is so nice. Yeah. <laughs> So this is just an all-purpose flour. Uh, I usually like to use unbleached all-purpose flour. I'm going to put a cup and a half in, but again, you like this brand. King Arthur, yeah. King Arthur's good. Uh, so this is my third one, right? Yeah, because I want a cup and a half. And then I'm going to do the cornmeal. Meal. I'm going to do about two thirds cup of cornmeal. One third, two thirds. Okay, then you can start. Mixing that up with your hands. Okay. It's so soft. And now the mystery of the zested lemon is revealed because we need to add the grated zest of a lemon to our brisolona. And then you get a uh, heavy board. So, preferably one that doesn't taste of fish. This is what they call a microplane. Uh, and I really like it for zesting lemons because it's very sharp, uh, but also very fine. Because the goal here is to get the yellow skin of the lemon, but not dig into the white pith which is usually bitter. So go all the way around the lemon. And so you see the one that was already zested was from the cake that I made yesterday. And I have not gotten to eat it. That Gabriella has restrained herself with great willpower to dig into. Not just Gabriella, by the way, the other participants here. <laughs> Yes, this is my wife, Leo, who's been feeding me questions. So, we add the zest. And you keep on mixing. Okay. <laughs> and then we're going to add eggs, two eggs, just the egg yolks. When I separate eggs, what I like to do is not go back and forth from one half of the shell to the other, which is always jagged and pointy and can puncture the yolk, but just put my hand out with my hands, fingers just slightly apart like this, and then let the white slip through and then put it in there. And basically you just kind of break the uh, yolk. So, so fun. <laughs> Okay, let me get the other egg in and then I'm going to take the fish out. It's so actually very stable. It's, it's pretty strong. Ooh, there it goes. Okay, there's the other one. Why do you do this with your hands instead of uh, a whisk or something? Because you cannot whisk dry ingredients. I mean, you could do it with a wooden spoon, but with a wooden spoon, you don't have the ability to, uh, you know, crumble it. You know, when the egg yolk breaks up and you distribute it, it's like you're forming little pellets, right? So I'm going to pull the uh, salmon out and let's see. You can't just see this area here, can you? 
I so can move it. I'll put it in the middle here. We'll just move things around a lot. That's all right. Okay. Watch it. Okay. It smells good. That's a good sign. And okay. The nice thing about aluminum foil is that it's hot, but not incredibly hot. So you can actually uh, handle it with your hands. But be careful of the steam that comes out because that's going to be pretty hot. Let me just check and see. I'm going to put it in for just a little bit longer and then I. Okay. okay, we'll finish the cake and then this will be ready. Okay. Okay, so the next part. We're at seven more minutes. Seven more minutes of what? Okay, but we didn't really start at five. That's true. Okay, so uh, we have the butter here. This is the most fun part of making this cake. Mm -hmm. Okay, the butter you need to take out so that it's not rock hard because it should be soft. And also, you want to have it kind of cut up into little bits. So Ooh. you continue doing that and you just distribute it That's everywhere. Right. So let me see how much finish I'm doing. It's looking good. I think I'm going to give them just a couple more minutes and then they'll be done. Okay. Question? Charlotte Thurman would like to know how much butter. How much butter? That was eight tablespoons of butter. Okay. But, you know, we didn't use any butter in any of the other dishes, so we make up for it by putting a little butter in our dessert. Okay. Uh, how's that coming? It's, it's going. Okay. We probably need to do a little bit more there. And we're going to get some plates to serve our So the nice thing about this meal is that you can prepare things ahead of time easily. Uh, the salmon, you can assemble way ahead of time, and then you can just put it in the oven when it's time uh, you know, to go to eat. And then the spinach and chickpeas also, you can cook, have cooked your spinach ahead of time, and then it really just takes 10 minutes. And obviously the cake, you can even make the day before. Question. Lois Portnoff asks how much almond and sugar, and Nancy Downey says <laughs> how much butter should we Okay, why don't I just give you all the ingredients, okay? We started out with half a cup of sugar, four ounces of almonds, then we added the uh, uh, cup and a half of uh, all-purpose flour, two-thirds of a cup of uh, cornmeal, and uh, the zest of one lemon, and then uh, two egg yolks and eight tablespoons of butter. Is that good? Is that ready? Oh, um, yeah, I think that's ready. Okay, so this is a 10 inch baking pan. Basically, you don't need to use a, a spring form pan because it will come out very easily. One thing we do need to add that I forgot to 
pull out. It's some butter for the uh, cake pan, okay? That is not included in the eight tablespoons. Just take a stick of butter and smear the bottom and the sides with the butter. Like this, and go around the sides. Like this, and then, this is ready, up, take that, and then you pour this in and kind of spread it out evenly. In the meantime, you will have uh, preheated your oven on regular, you don't want to press though, you just kind of, yeah, distribute. The oven is preheated at 375 on the bake setting. And we put it in and we bake it for approximately 40 minutes. Uh, you might want to check maybe 35 minutes. It should have kind of a brown look. Well, you can see right there. Okay, I'm not putting it in right now because I've got a fish in there. Yeah. So we have a number of questions. Uh, can you come in and select things that make it food? More efficient. Pastry cutter to cut what? Okay. Um, <laughs> Question was to use a whether I should use a pastry cutter. The other Neil Roth wants to know if the spinach is just simmering or boiling, and how do you know when it's done? Excellent question. Uh, is the spinach simmering or boiling, and how do you know when it is done? It is. A good steady simmer, not like on high, on a rolling boil, but it shouldn't be very, very low either. And to know when it's done, you can't really see that. I know, I have to bring it up. I'm trying to formulate, I have to explain it because it's the spinach kind of changes color a little bit. It started out bright, bright green, but as it uh, stews and braises with the lemon juice, particularly chickpeas, it starts to be more of a muted green. And so when it's all like that, it's done. But generally, it's about 10 minutes. So, you know, it's, you've done it for nine minutes or you've done it for 12 minutes, uh, it's really fine. Okay, I think that we are ready. We're going to pull out our fish and we're going to plate everything. And Gabriel will finally be able to eat the cake. Yeah, yeah. Me too. Okay, you have to move out of the way. <laughs> hey, Kayla, I'm going to open this up and tilt it so hopefully it can be seen better. Now it's all coming out. Move the bottom one. Can you see that? Okay. It's very juicy. It is very juicy. The juiciness is, is the definitely white, part of it. White film salmon? That's just the salmon exuding uh, a, uh, a moisture like that. It's, it's nothing to be concerned about. So then, we have a nice piece of fish on our plate, like this, with some of the juice. Make sure it has lots of tomatoes, too. And then we put some uh, spinach and chickpeas inside, like this. And then this is ready. And then the cake. Thank you. Be careful that this is hot. Then, as if they've seen it, I'm going to move it out of the way. And the fun part for the cake, of course, is to break it up. You can, you can cut it. Uh, but not very cleanly, okay? 
and go like this, and you see how it kind of breaks apart? So it's just pieces. And so you see, here it is. See inside, it's nice and, and yellow. And there we go. So we have a nice little meal here. Salmon, chippy, and sbrizolona. Are there any other last minute questions here before we sign off? Yes, people would like to know the si size of the cake pan. It was a 10 inch, 10 inch cake pan. You could do it even up to 12 inches. We're starting with dessert, I see. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, well, uh, there aren't any other questions. Thank you so much for joining us today with this class. And I hope that uh, you will enjoy making this meal. Please let me know how it turns out. Again, you can reach me through my website at julianohazan.com and that's where you can find out about uh, not just our olive oil, but other products that uh, we have that are available. I have my mother's famous tomato sauce. I have a fabulous rice from the Veneto, a red wine vinegar, and also uh, all our cooking classes and courses in Italy. So thank you so much. Buon appetito. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting us into your home and Vitello, everyone. Thank you. That was more than great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Lots of fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was a lot of fun. We enjoyed it. Love seeing the whole family. We're Thanks. We're hungry now. Thanks a lot. It was fabulous. <laughs> Nancy, how can we never come up on this? I don't know. Maybe we do do that. No, I'm unmuted. Okay, I'm getting up. Okay.